much. It's, uh, it's my great honor to be here uh, speaking at a stem cell conference with so many distinguished stem cell biologists and to present our work. And I, I won't be talking today actually about any of our work on the biology of aging, um, but I'll talk about the, the work we've been doing on studying stem cell quiescence. And I'll <clears throat> give you a little background on really all published work on how we became interested in this, because we, we didn't go into, into, into this field with a question of understanding quiescence, but we've been, been driven to ask questions about quiescence by the data, and I think it's actually a very, very interesting aspect of stem cell biology that holds a lot of secrets that we're only just beginning to, to learn. I actually think it holds a lot of secrets of what makes a stem cell in vivo, a stem cell. So I just wanted to start with this diagram of the, of the cell cycle, a very familiar cell cycle. The cells go from G1 to S, G2 to M, and then talk about this phase, this G0 phase, that is when cells are out, actually outside the cell cycle and, and what that means and, and how we think of this in terms of the state of quiescence in stem cells. So there are, there are different types of G0, and I've illustrated a couple of them here. So one is, is differentiated cells, so post-mitotic cells like in the heart or in the brain. These cells have withdrawn from the cell cycle, neurons, cardiomyocytes, and they will stay outside the cell cycle, pretty much resistant to entering the cell cycle in any way, and so that's a G0 state. There's a state, so-called senescence, which is the state that cells will enter if they undergo too many replications. Double mic? Great, welcome. And, uh, and so this is a, a state that cells will enter, having again gone through many divisions and then withdrawn from the cell cycle, and again irreversibly. So it's very, very difficult to get cells out of G0 back into G1 from this senescent state. Now, these G0 states are in marked contrast to the G0 state that a quiescent stem cell sits in, because these cells are meant to be reversibly out of the cell cycle, and so they enter the cell cycle, and then they can reversibly return to quiescence. Okay, so this is, this is the, the, the state that, that, that is of interest, and I'll talk about, again, how we became interested in the state and in particular, I'll present two projects in which we're really studying how cells exit from quiescence back in a cell cycle. Uh, and I won't talk about re-entry into quiescence, but that's another area of active research in the laboratory. So the, the stem cell that I'll talk about primarily comes from uh, the stem cell in skeletal muscle. This is a cross-section of, of normal skeletal muscle stained with H&E stain. And um, basically, muscle is a highly post-mitotic tissue, very little evidence of any cell division going on in an entire muscle. And within this, this field, um, there actually would exist, one, if one could identify by H&E, a, a couple of stem cells. They're, they're quiescent. They represent maybe a couple of percent of the nuclear content of the whole muscle. Um, but they can remain in this quiescent state uh, in in humans, we think for decades without entering the cell cycle, but then it can be called upon, and I'll, I'll illustrate that. This is the, the first electron micrograph of a so-called satellite cell um, shown here, found by Alexander Morrow in 1961. And this is the cell shown here, which he actually termed a satellite cell because it seemed to be orbiting, essentially, the muscle fibers. So the muscle fibers shown, shown below, very, very large cell. And here's the basal lamina that actually overlays the skeletal muscle fiber and enc encases this very tiny cell with very little cytoplasm. It's almost all nucleus, very heterochromatic nucleus. And he predicted, actually, at this time, when he found this cell, that this might be the source of the regenerative potential of muscle. Before, before people were using the word stem cell, he predicted this might be a stem cell. And it turned out to be right. And I think this might be the only case where this, the stem cell was actually identified anatomically before it was identified functionally. So I actually found the cell first. And here's a, a more modern view of, of that cell. So here's a, a single muscle fiber shown here. Um, and here, the nuclei are stained with, with DAPI. So here's a myonucleus inside the muscle fiber. And muscle fibers, of course, are the few true syncytia in the, in the body one cytoplasm, hundreds of thousands of nuclei. And this is a single one of these fibers cut in cross-section. And here is a so-called satellite cell or muscle stem cell stained with a trans an antibody against transcription factor PAC7, which is entirely specific for this population of cells. So it's expressed in muscle only in skeletal muscle stem cells. And again, it's almost all nucleus, has very little cytoplasm, and that's essentially staining this whole cell sitting very, very closely associated with its, its uh, parent muscle fiber. But this shows the kind of regenerative potential of these few stem cells. Here's a, a normal uninjured muscle. Here's a muscle a couple of days after a total necrotic injury, which in that entire architecture has been disrupted. And within this chaos, there's a lot of inflammation, but these very few stem cells 
exit the cell cycle, uh, exit quiescence, enter the cell cycle, proliferate massively, line up, begin to fuse with one another. See, these are these newly so-called myotubes. These are newly formed multinucleated cells, again shown in cross-section. And then over the course of a couple of weeks, that normal architecture of muscle will be completely restored and you will get a restoration of the stem cell pool. So these cells not only make mature muscle, but they replace themselves, so true stem cells in the tissue. So really a tremendous regenerative potential. Well, for, for a long time now, we've been in, interested in understanding what the molecular pathways that control this transition from quiescence through activation and differentiation. And we and many other people have studied this in some detail. Um, many years ago, with Irina Conboy when she was a postdoc in my lab, we began to try to understand the process by which these cells from activation undergo this very rapid and dramatic proliferative amplification and then differentiation. And we found that the activation of the notch pathway was critical for this, tran this tr transient amplifying phase. And then in fact, notch signaling had to decline for these cells to differentiate. So our interest was really in the role of notch signaling in this prolifer proliferative amplification of these cells. Well, we so to try and study this in more detail, we decided to try and knock out notch signaling in this population. And to do that, we used an inducible Cree strain in which Cree ER is knocked into the PAC7 locus. So when we get tamoxifen, genetic recombination would occur only in the muscle stem cells. And in this case, we used a flox allele for the uh, transcriptional coactivator of the notch pathway, RBPJ. And so what we, we, we pr pr uh, proposed was that we could knock out notch signaling in this adult stem cell, and that when we activated them, they would then, we would be able to understand better what notch signaling was doing. And we'd of course have in the background also these lineage markers so we could identify the cells in which um, notch signaling had been de depleted. But what we found was a surprise. What was, we found is when we knocked out RBPJ, so we blocked notch signaling, spontaneously from the quiescent state, something started to happen. So, so what we found is these cells spontaneously, so here's one of these, uh, these satellite cells, begin to express these markers myOD. This is a protein that's never on in quiescent cells, and it's a marker of cells that have actually beginning to activate and entering the cell cycle. In fact, we find these cells do enter the cell cycle, and they actually spontaneously differentiate. So we were proposing to look at this during this lineage progression, but it turns out that even in the quiescent state, notch signaling is active and maintaining these cells quiescent. So we revised the model where actually there's a high level of notch signaling in this quiescent state. We didn't expect that actually goes down and then goes back up again for this transit amplifying state. So we, we began interested. So if it's, that's the case, if these cells really are kind of having this active process to keep them quiescent, what else is unique about the quiescent state? So this is just from a, a review that I wrote with one of my postdocs, Tom Chung, in which we asked if we look at transcriptional profiles across stem cell compartments that have been published, and we compare the, the transcriptional patterns of quiescent cells from the skin, from the blood, and from muscle, are there patterns that are, that are shared between these quiescent stem cells? What we found was a series of genes, some that go um, up with activation, these are shown in red, and some that actually go down with activation, so highly expressed in the quiescent state. And one of the, the genes that was particularly interesting to us is that DICER, you know, master regulator of microRNA processing, is very high in quiescent cells and goes down with activation as these cells enter the cell cycle. So we, we were very interested in, in looking at what DICER might be doing in the quiescent state. And so we basically took quiescent cells and activated cells from muscle. We did a microRNA microarray, and we found a series of about 20 microRNAs that are very highly expressed in the quiescent state. And they go down or disappear in the active state. So we looked at several of these, but one in particular that we, we looked at was microRNA 489. And what was particularly interesting is when we, when we knocked down the activity of microRNA-489 using an antagomere injected systemically, the cells that we're looking at, which we're looking at basically proliferation here, in the controls these cells are never dividing, if we knock down microRNA-489 in these cells, they all again spontaneously exit the quiescence. They spontaneously start to divide. So again, evidence of this very active regulation of the quiescent state by at least two different pathways. We know that notch signaling maintains this pathway. We know that this microRNA maintains quiescence. In fact, we, we know one of the targets, DEK, is kept suppressed by this microRNA. If we get rid of this, DEK goes up and drives the cells out of quiescence. So it really started to change our view of the quiescent state from one of really, we always thought of it as this kind of very quiescent, 
very metabolically quiet, very transcriptionally quiet cell, to one that really a state of kind of a highly active, restrained state. In fact, the more we study the transcriptional and even the translational aspects of quiescence, we see these cells are poised in a very dramatic way to enter the cell cycle, and they're actually being restrained from entering the cell cycle. So the quiescent state is hardly just one of dormancy and is actually very actively regulated. Okay, so this is actually a, a single muscle fiber that's been dissected in culture. You can't see it well here, but here are myonuclei, and here are one of these um, quiescent satellite cells. So we've really been interested in trying to understand uh, the, the nature of this quiescence, and then what I'll talk about is the transition from the quiescent state into the activated state and what controls that. And so I'll tell, I'll tell two stories about this, and actually both of them are related to cell size. And I should emphasize the fact that like a lot of other quiescent stem cells, these cells are tiny. I've, I've mentioned this in, in the sense that they're really all nucleus and no cytoplasm. So they're very, very small. So I'll tell about one story, actually was just recently published on the dynamics of the quiescent state, and then I'll end with talking about some work of the um, energetics of activating out of the quiescent state. So this is a, an assay that we've begun to use that's been very useful in understanding um, the, this process of quiescence to activation. What we're looking at here is we take these stem cells, we sort them by flow cytometry, we place them in culture, and then we watch them. And what we ask is how long does it take for one of these quiescent cells to divide? So each one of these represents an individual cell, and you can see that in this population, at this time, the average cell took about 30 hours to divide, the first division. Okay. And then if we follow these same cells and we ask how long does it take to divide again, that's shown here, again, much, much faster. So about 10 hours. So this first division is extremely slow and it takes a long time for the cells to, to um, actually enter the cell cycle. So if we just shift this and we ask, well, if this is really the time it takes for the cell to divide, what's happening here? So what is all this delay? What is required for these cells to get to the point where they can actually divide? And really, the, what we've ended up focusing on is, is two phases. There's actually a prominent and, and incredibly important growth phase where the cells go from this very tiny cell with almost no cytoplasm to a, a normal size cell from which they then divide to form two daughters. So really, when we talk about activation, we now talk about these two different phases, growth and replication. So I'll start with this first story, and this is the, the work all of, a, of a postdoc in the lab, Joe Rogers, who is very interested in the biology of cell size and organ size. And so he's, he's really intrigued by these phenomena. He became interested in just watching these cells going from these very tiny quiescent cells through these activated larger cells and even at larger at two days, at, at which point they've, they've started to divide. So he was studying this and he was using actually flow cytometry where you can get a good measure of, of cell size. Here are the small quiescent cells after one day. And here we're doing an injury to the muscle, which actually is the stimulus for these cells in vivo to break quiescence and enter the cell cycle. And after four days, they're much, much larger. So he was studying this process, trying to understand what controls the growth of these cells that have been activated in response to an injury. And so he would do this injury, we use barium chloride, it causes a destructive injury to muscle, and injure one leg of the mouse, one muscle of one leg of the mouse. And of course, he was using the contralateral leg as a control, because of course, that's an uninjured muscle. So those, those cells are, of course, a good control, or are they? So, so what, he, what he found was very interesting, was that it's a very small effect. I discouraged him from working on this, but he was convinced this was interesting. When he would do this, this tiny shift, he would see that after a couple of days, on the other side of the animal, the stem cells in that other leg had gotten a little bit bigger. And they're just a little bit bigger, but you know, enough that he could actually measure them, that on average, there was about 10% larger. These are the quiescent cells, we call these the contralateral stem cells, and these are the activated cells. These are the cells that are in response to an injury. These are cells actively dividing. So these are much larger, but these contralateral cells are a little bit bigger than quiescent cells. And not only are they larger, but he actually started to study how these cells might differ functionally from truly quiescent cells, and in fact, they're remarkably different. So here, what he did is he's giving an in vivo pulse of BRDU, and in an uninjured animal, so these are the quiescent cells, there's very little BRDU incorporation. This is a logarithmic scale. So much less than 1% of the cells in this paradigm will take up BRDU. In a muscle that's been injured, these cells are actively proliferating, and virtually 100% of the cells are dividing. But on this other side, in this contralateral side, away from the side of injury, he found, again, not high, but still several percent, at least tenfold greater increase in BRDU labeling in cells 
contralateral to the site of injury. And using this time to first division uh, assay again, these are the activated cells, so they're proliferating very rapidly. These are from an uninjured animal, completely very quiescent. So in this case, they had a very long time to first division, about 60 hours. But these contralateral stem cells, that he started to call alert stem cells, they enter the cell cycle much more quickly than uninjured animals. So they are clearly functionally very different. And then he asked, well, what is the consequence of a cell being in the alert state? And so what he did to test this is he compared regeneration of a muscle from an, uh, a muscle that had not been injured from that of a muscle that had been primed by an injury to the other side of the body. So here again, here's the control, just a normal animal, and then an injury is done to, to, to one muscle, and then a few days later we look at the, the result of that regeneration. But if instead he primes one, the other side, waits three days, and then does an injury to this side, and then looks at the regeneration of the, of the prime side, what he found was that in this alert regeneration, the regeneration is much more rapid. The muscle fiber sizes were more rapid if the animals were given a pre-injury on the other side. And this is just looking at cross-sectional area. It just tells you how large the muscle fibers are. So in black is the control, and in uh, tan is the primed response. And then you can see a shift towards larger muscle fibers at three and six days after injury. So it's a more rapid response. This is just another way to show this. This is the recovery of the size of the fibers over time in the control, and this is the primed response. Not only do they recover faster, but they actually result in muscle fibers that are larger than the control. And physiologically, we, can, we show that these are actually regenerating fibers that are physiologically more mature than the uninjured muscle. So, so a very surprising result that there's this systemic signal, it seems, coming from an area of injury that's actually priming stem cells to become more active as stem cells. And it turns out this, this is true throughout the body. So if he injures the right hind limb muscles, the left hind limb muscles activated, shown by increased BRD incorporation, but so do muscles of the thigh and muscles of the forelimb. The stem cells in those muscles also activate from this quiescent state to this alert state. And it isn't even just for muscle injury. So if he did a, a, a bone injury or just did a skin incision on the back of the animal, he could again induce muscle stem cells to alert in response to this, this distant injury. And they, they stay in this alert state actually for a long time, it turns out. So I'll talk about this in a second. This is a biochemical marker. So non-injured animals have this uh, level of phosphorus staining. In the alert state, they go way up, and then it takes almost a month for them to come back down to the control level. And that's just shown here again by this ex vivo EDU incorporation. These are activated cells and these are the alert cells. They're, they incorporate and enter the cell cycle much more rapidly, and it's only after several weeks that they return to that kind of quiescent phenotype. This is just some principal component analysis, and we've looked at the quiescent cells compared to the activated cells shown here. Here's that axis, and these contralateral cells uh, fall intermediate along this axis, but then after 28 days, they return back to the, the same, very similar to quiescent stem cells. So they really seem to be able to enter this alert state, stay there, most of them without ever entering the cell cycle, and then gradually returning back to this quiescent state. So he's interested in, in again, in the idea of these cells getting bigger, so he, he of course, looked at TOR signaling, which is an important regulator of cell growth, and what he found was that in quiescent muscle stem cells, um, staining for phosphorus S6 kinase, a marker of TOR signaling, is, is absent in the control, but he could see staining for a phosphorus S6 kinase in these contralateral stem cells, these large stem cells. And if you looked at this by flow, the quiescent cells are shown in red here, uh, the activated cells are shown in blue, so a lot of increase in phosphorus 6 And these alert cells shown in green, it actually she sees two peaks, one at the quiescent level and one at the activated level. So it seems as if TOR signaling is in increased quite a bit in these cells and perhaps accounting for this increase in size. So he looked at this genetically, and this is just the canonical TOR signaling pathway in, in which um, receptor tyrosine kinase is basically uh, inactivate this TSC1, TSC2 complex, which in turn inactivate TOR signaling. And that uh, TOR signaling can be uh, modulated by uh, components of this mTORC1 complex. So what he did a couple of genetic models. He first knocked out Raptor, which is a positive co-regulator of TOR signaling in, sp in muscle stem cells in the adult. And when he did that, basically that would completely inhibit TOR signaling in these cells. And he could show, in fact, that when he knocks out Raptor, these cells are unable to signal through TOR. Well, when he did that and then looked at this alerting response, it was completely blocked. So here we're just looking at cell size. So here's the quiescent cells and the contralateral cells completely superimposed. So none of the shift in size and looking at this propensity to enter the cell cycle, this is the control and here's the raptor knockout. So the, you, 
basically seems as if TOR signaling is nece necessary for these cells to enter the alert state. So he, he did the converse experiment, which he knocked out TSC1, which is a negative regulator of TOR signaling, and that should, in theory, lead to a constitutive activation of TOR signaling in these muscle stem cells. And again, he could demonstrate this very clearly. These cells were highly active in terms of, of TOR signaling. And uh, if you looked at phosphorus 6 staining, for example, here's the wild-type control with no stain. These cells are, are blazingly positive for phosphorus 6 kinase. And if he looks at then these um, now TOR positive cells in these animals without any injury, he sees these cells are basically constitutively in this alert state. So the cells are larger than the control, they enter the cell cycle much more quickly than control, and they typically will incorporate BRDU uh, much more readily than the control. So in this sense, that, that puts TOR as both necessary and sufficient. If you activate TOR signaling, you can induce these cells to enter this alert state. So we're very interested in what's downstream and what's upstream. We've been working a lot on what's upstream of this. And you know, really, what, is the, what are the signals that might be coming from the circulation? How are they communicating to the cell to enter this alert state? And what Joe did, first of all, he, there's a, a well-known uh, signaling pathway, the HGF CMET pathway, that has been studied for, for many decades, primarily by, by Ron Allen at the University of Arizona, that it's important for activation of these stem cells. So he looked at um, this pathway, HGF CMET, so the CMET is the receptor, and he knocked out CMET, again, specifically in muscle stem cells, and what he found is that also blocked the ability of these cells to the end of the alert state, here by measuring phosphoesic staining, BRDU incorporation, and again, this time to first division. So it seems as if at least an important component of the signaling pathway that's inducing um, TOR signaling and alerting the cells is coming from this HGF CMET, CMET axis. Okay, so that is, is intriguing. We're, we're now working our way back up to try and figure out what the signaling is that's coming systemically, but it raises a lot of other questions. So muscle stem cells seem to alert in response to, other, to, to, to injuries, not only to muscle, but to other tissues, but what about other stem cell compartments? So we've looked at a few of those. And so if we look at this one population, so-called fibroadipogenic progenitors, which is another stem cell population in skeletal muscle, we see the same response. So contralateral to the injury, there's no BRDU incorporation or EDU in this case. Ipsilateral to the injury, almost all the cells enter the cell cycle. And but contralateral to an injury, these so-called contralateral FAPs, they enter the cell cycle much more readily than quiescent FAPs. So again, a distant response for a stem cell compartment. And then we've looked at uh, long-term hematopoietic stem cells. Here, looking at phospho mTOR, this has been done in collaboration with Peggy Goodell's lab at Baylor. And again, now producing a muscle injury induces TOR signaling in long-term hematopoietic stem cells. If we look at other aspects of, of these hematopoietic stem cells, we see high levels of phospho-S6 kinase staining, and if we give them a stimulus to, to mobilize them, in this case, gamma interferon, this is the control response. But if we first alert the animal by giving a muscle injury, we see a much greater increase in the mobilization of hematopoietic stem cells in response to this distant injury. Interestingly, so Joe, Joe started to work on skin wound healing, and this turns out to be very, a great system, partly because you can see it so clearly. And so what he does is he produces these two punch holes in the skin of an animal, either with or without a priming injury um, from the muscle. And what he finds is the re recovery, here shown the control, is much more rapid if he's done it in this kind of alert condition, just showing basically the healing shown here. So skin wound healing is enhanced if there's a prior injury to the muscle. So we, we've again kind of changed our view of really going from, from, or not so much changed our view, but expanded this idea that if G0 is, is a restrained state, then these G-alert are even more poised. That is, they've, they've really gone to the point where they're much more able to respond to a systemic single signal to enter the cell cycle and do what these stem cells do, which is, is to repair muscle. So we have this idea that maybe this is actually a quiescent cell cycle, maybe more um, stages than just G0 and G alert, but basically in response to an injury, which at least in this case in muscle is mediated by this uh, signaling pathway, we think these cells enter the alert state still in quiescence, but now they're in this alert state of quiescence. Some of them will spontaneously enter the cell cycle, but most of them will stay in this alert state and then return back um, to the quiescent state, if not given another activation signal, and this is something we're working on. Okay, so um, I just want to finish, I have a few minutes left, by, by talking about another project which is again looking at this transition between the quiescent state and the activated state. And this is all work of a postdoc in the lab, Ann Tang. So back to this idea that these cells start as these very tiny quiescent cells, and then they enter this phase where they undergo a, a tremendous amount of growth over the course 
of 24 to 48 hours. And the question that Anne was interested in was, um, and remains interested in, really is, is well, what, what fuels that growth? I mean, this is a, a huge amount of growth in terms of cell size. We see very few cells that will change size this dramatically. And she was interested in understanding what regulates this transition and, and what controls it, and, and then also what controls the re revert back to quiescence. But just as an example, she's just measuring ATP levels. This is a log scale. Um, these are activated cells one day, one and a half days, and two and a half days after injury. Huge increase in size, huge increase in ATP. So clearly there's a huge energetic demand. And so the, really the question is, you know, what's controlling this huge anabolic function in which there's a tremendous synthesis of macromolecules, there's a huge increase in ATP, there's a huge amount of organellogenesis, so increase in mitochondria, um, and so this is all happening over a very short time. And the question is, if we think about the catabolic and anabolic functions of the cell, how is this happening? So we began studying um, basically different catabolic and anabolic pathways. And, and one of the pathways that turned out to be interesting was the pathway regulating autophagy. Um, so this is just an illustration of the autophagic uh, process in which these autophagosomes are, are formed um, in, in, with a lot of the components that I'll talk about, LC3B, um, some of the uh, ATG compounds, basically form this, this nucleation complex that makes the autophagosome, fuses with the lysosome, to really, the, at least in the canonical way, is meant to, to degrade cellular components. So everything from, from molecules to, to organ, organelles uh, can be degraded by the, by the autophagosome. So what Anne found, um, which was a surprise to us, was that in this transition from this very quiescent state to this activated state, there was a, a marked increase in autophagic activity. And the way she measured that was in several ways, but one is she has a mouse that has um, an LC3 GFP transgene, and basically you, you can see the formation of these autophagosomes shown as these now GFP positive punctae by using an inhibitor of the, of the final autophagosome autophagic process. So they tend to accumulate these autophagosomes. So you can get this as an indirect measure of autophagic flux, but over the course of 12 and 24 hours, major increase in these autophagosomes, and that's associated with lipidation of LC3B. Here's shown at time zero, and then after 24 hours, indicative of, again, of a, of a marked upregulation of autophagic activity. And she could, so that was in vitro. She says the same thing in vivo. She does, does an injury and then isolates the cells by flow cytometry at the same time points. She again sees the same kind of dramatic increase in autophagic activity compared to the quiescent state. And what was interesting is that if she, if she blocked autophagy using either chemical inhibitors or siRNA treatments against ATG5 and 7, or if she knocked out ATG5 using, again, that PAC7 CRE-ER mouse specifically in muscle stem cells, she could delay the activation of these cells. So not only was autophagic activity increasing during this time, but it seemed to be necessary for the cells, not completely, but it certainly markedly delayed their exit from quiescence, growth, and entry into the cell cycle. And so this, this seemed to us to be a paradox, is that at a time when the cells are basically producing this huge amount of uh, macromolecular uh, components to the cell and, and uh, doing a lot of biosynthesis, why would it be turning up this degradative uh, process that's involved in turning over cellular components? Now, we could wave our hands and say, maybe it's um, removing misfolded proteins. We didn't know, but it basically it was a surprise to us how much increase there was um, in autophagy during this process of massive growth. Well, we were, we were intrigued by this paper that came out a few years ago for, from Einstein, in which the, um, the investigators were actually looking at the same phenomenon during T-cell activation, and again found that autophagy was essential for normal T-cell activation in response, in response to a stimulus, and that if they blocked autophagy, they could block this, um, this transition of the, of the T-cell from, from non-activated to activated, and it appeared to be that it was actually, autophagy was important for producing um, small molecule nutrients and components for biomass required for T cell activation. So really almost a generator of, of uh, components for that process. So, and clearly one of the most important drivers of autophagy is, um, is starvation. And, and that's a, again a case where cells break down some components to use the biomass that's produced for survival and generation of, of energy. So we, we hypothesize that really this massive growth that occurs and this activation out of quiescence is sort of a relative state of nutrient deprivation. There's so much need that the cell views this as a relative nutrient deprivation state and is using resources in order to generate um, components for, for macromolecular synthesis. And this is just illustrated here where here's an autophagosome. Not, not only does it turn over proteins, but 
the, in, the pro, in the process of turning over proteins and lipids and carbohydrates, it produces these components for building blocks. So sugars, uh, fatty acids, amino acids that can feed into the TCLA cycle. So this can actually produce biomass that can be used by the cell for energetic demands at a time when there might be a relative energetic need. So this is the hypothesis that we're working on. And the, the one piece of data that, that supports this that she has is this, is that if she knocks down ATG5 and 7, so blocks autophagy and delays um, exit from quiescence and entering the cell cycle, she can m partially rescue that phenotype by an exogenous um, nutrient, pyruvate. So basically, by providing the cell something that may, it may be needing and that is provided by the autophagic process, it can actually rescue these phenotypes in terms of growth, ATP production, and entry in the cell cycle. So, so we're exploring this in more detail, but um, really this is kind of a, a different view of what autophagy might be doing during this process of rapid cellular growth. So just to finish, we're, we're interested in what, what controls autophagy during this process, and we've been studying uh, this, this molecule, SIRT1, one of the sirtuins, which is a clear, um, one, one of the most important uh, sensors of the nutrient status of a cell, and, and it's clearly important for regulating autophagy. It's very important. People study this in terms of the role of, of autophagy in, in uh, survival and, and in terms of lifespan even. So what Anne did is she asked, well, what happens if she blocks SIRT1 again during this process of stem cell activation using a small molecule inhibitor of, of SIRT1? Can't see this very well, but again, we're looking at LC3 positive puncte, um, almost you know, basically none at, at no, uh, no concentration of this drug. But as the concentration increases, she could basically block um, the formation of these, uh, these autophagosomes. And if she used other ways to, to block SIRT1 signaling, so she knocked out SIRT1 in, in muscle stem cells. And what she found is that if she knocked out SIRT1, it could um, basically, she would see this increase in um, uh, LC3B peroxidation in the control, but in the SIRT1 knockout, it was much reduced. And basically, she could knock down the induction of autophagy by knocking down SIRT1. So it seems as if SIRT1 was actually regulating the process of autophagosome formation. And that's been shown in other systems. Um, if she looks at this process of activation, when she knocks on SIRT1, there's a, a reduction in EDU incorporation. And again, even in this case, that inhibition of activation could be rescued by giving to the cells an exogenous nutrient source, pyruvate. So the, the model is that again, SIRT1 is regulating autophagic activity, which is then providing uh, biomass to the cell. And she did other experiments to look at basically how SIRT1 might be regulating autophagy, and some of this has been determined in other systems, but she was looking at the um, binding of, of SIRT1 to AG, TG5 and 7, showing a clear binding to ATG7 but not ATG5, and in the SIRT1 knockout, a reduction in that binding. Um, she looked at basically the uh, amount of acetylation of ATG7 by sirtuins. It's deacetylated in the control, but there's less deacetylation in the SIRT1 knockout, suggesting that it's actually a deacetylase activity, which is what SIRT1 is known to do. Um, it also has a profound effect on the AMPK alpha um, signaling and, and that pathway of, of nutrient sensing and, and, and metabolic control. So in the control, there's high levels of phospho-AMPK alpha, whereas in the SIRT1 knockout, much reduced, whereas the, the TOR pathway is actually little affected by SIRT1 in this system. So it seems to be controlling autophagy at least by two pathways, direct regulation of ATG proteins and regulation of the AMPK pathway. So the, the current model is, is this, that basically SIRT1 is sensing a relative nutrient deprivation during this process of activation, inducing autophagic flux, which is actually producing for the cell these nutrients and these biomass for macromolecular synthesis in the form of amino acids, sugars, um, fatty acids. And that's an important and essential process for these cells to go from this tiny cell to this very large cell in a very short time with a huge increase in cellular ATP. So we've, we just added this little arm to this, to this loop is that when these cells are in G0 and then they actually have to activate and enter the cell cycle with a lot of growth, there's this cycle where there's an induction of SIRT1, increase of AMPK, AMPK, increase in autophagy that actually promotes and allows the cells to go through this process and then actually enter the cell cycle once the cell size has reached its final form. 
Okay, so I'll just, I'll end there, and I just want to again acknowledge the people who did this work. Joe Rogers did all the work on the alert state that I talked about, and is working on this uh, metabolic control of cell growth um, through regulation of autophagy. I mentioned Peggy Goodell, our close collaborator at Baylor, who's looking at the hematoperic stem cells in a lot of these alert phen uh, phenotypes, and I just wanted to um, obviously acknowledge the support for this work. Um, Glenn Foundation for Medical Research has supported a lot of our work, and California Institute of Regenerative Medicine is supporting basically all of our human muscle stem cell work, which I didn't talk about today, and all the work that has a lot of this kind of work translating into what we hope will be for therapy for, for muscle diseases. So I will stop there, and I'll happy to take any questions. Thank you. cellular manipulations we do. So, so you're asking, is the alert state really just G1? Well, well, is it really G1 sort of from a different perspective? I mean, I, I guess maybe it's semantic. I'm not sure how to, basically the cells can stay in this state without progressing past G1 for a long time. So in that sense, you know, you'd have to call it an arrested G1 or something like that. I'm not sure because I think you know, well, first of all, the, the, the markers of G1 are not up, so specific cyclins, so they're not, so we do see a difference molecularly, um, but it is somewhere in this kind of transition between G0 and, and G1 is what I would say. Um, it is somewhat surprising that uh, the cell will degrade its uh, something, right, when it needs to grow and grow pretty yeah. aggressively. Is there any idea of is there a particular compartment? Of, is it like a remodeling or reshuffling of the old components that need, does need to be in that cell? But I'm thinking what is specific for this quest and state it doesn't require an you know, alert cell. I mean, it, it can be half of the cell protein metabolome, right? It well, should be some very specific right. protein. So what, what's your guess? Right, I mean, I guess so, so it's, a, it's, a, it's an important question. It's, what, it's what, we're, what's we, what we're wondering, which is, First of all, it's clear that a cell can target specific components for degradation. So we're not talking, you know, and you can mark these by P62. And so we're looking to see if we can identify which components of the quiescent state are degraded in this transition. And there are a lot of, um, certainly, RNAs that are high, and there are some proteins that are high in quiescence and go down. So we would hypothesize that these are the components that are being degraded, but we don't have any direct evidence of that yet. I think the best comparison is really the starvation comparison. So you have a cell that is not overproducing anything. That You put the cell in starvation, it degrades a lot of its components to target the metabolites to other, other Pathway. So I think that's our model, is that there is a selective degradation. It's not a generic de degradation, but we need to identify what those components are. Um, on the first uh, part of your talk, could you explain a bit more the types of injury for the induction of the alert state? The types of what? Of injury. Types what of injury? Type? Yes. So the only injury that we found that doesn't do this it, it, so if we do a tail vein injection, we have not seen an induction of the alert state. Otherwise, every injury that we've done, which have been you know, large injuries, so we've not really been able to do a dose response, but like I said, skin injury, bone injury, muscle injury. Um, I mean, the thing is, almost every other injury produces a skin injury. So if skin injury alone does it, that, that would accompany most of the other injuries we would do. So I'm not sure what your question is getting at. We, we haven't found an injury that doesn't do it, but. I'm not sure if you're wondering about something specific. No, I, I just like a trauma just by a pressure uh, trauma or, or yeah, uh, like an injury by surgical incisions. Yeah, so... Do they um, make a difference in your responses? So injury by surgical incision would, would do it. So I mean, that's, that's the important... That, I guess that, that's the whole point, is that even surgical incisions put the cells into an alert state. So it, the, like I said, the only thing we found that doesn't do it, and we did this because we, had to, we were doing tail vein injections, and as a control, that didn't alert the cells. So that was minor enough that we didn't see it. Okay, yeah. Tom, that was really a, a very nice talk. Um, you know, mTOR plays a significant role in also in inhibiting autophagy, and so do you see the, the function of the mTOR playing a significant role in sort of 
keeping it in the alert state but not allowing it to go through this sort of autophagic uh, process to sort of activate. And then my other question would be, um, you know, clearly there are therapeutics out there that do target mTOR, rapamycin, uh, which is very potent. Um, what's the observation with that in terms of the pharmacology with respect to satellite cell activation in vivo? Okay, so, so, that's, a, so that's a good question. So we've done studies with rapamycin. Now the complexity is that when, you, when we use rapamycin, we can recapitulate they say the raptor knockout. So the, the initial activation of TOR is blocked and the initial alerting is blocked. That's all we can do because it turns out that TOR is playing a lot of functions in the cell. So if we look at proliferation, there are other things that are affected. So we've, we've had to restrict our analysis to that transition from G0 to G alert. Now your, second, your first part of your question is, is important because you're right, the TOR canonically blocks autophagy. And so if we have a cell that's TOR positive, and waiting to, to further activate and grow, what we're looking at is to what extent either TOR signaling goes down during that time, or there, and there are examples of TOR-independent autophagy. So we're trying, we're trying to separate that out. Which of those can account for a TOR-positive cell then using autophagy and not being inhibited by TOR? So, so I don't know the answer yet, but that's, we're looking at that right now. Sorry. Yeah. How important is the timing of the injury? Could you do it? Uh, almost at the same time, could you do it after and still get a result? Yeah, that's that's a good question. We, so we've we've done a little bit on the timing. So um, again, we we know that if you do an injury, that the cells remain in in the alert state for a long time. So you can your pre-injury can be weeks before. In terms of how close to the time of injury, we haven't we hadn't pushed that too much. Um, we knew that one day was sufficient. We probably we think that probably hours is sufficient. I was just actually uh, giving a talk in, in Melbourne, and colleagues there had done a similar, had done an experiment for other reasons, in which they had used simultaneous injury on one side and a, an experiment on the other side, and they have data that would suggest, which we're going to test right now, that simultaneous injury could do it. I'm not sure how that works, but it was enough that they saw an effect of having an injury on the contralateral side versus no injury affecting the muscle regeneration on the, on the ipsilateral side. So we'll go back now and test this as to whether a simultaneous injury can produce somewhat of a similar effect. But it seems like it's a very short time, at least in our hand, at least hours. Yep. Yes, so markers of stem cells are sort of a controversial, or satellite cells is a rather controversial uh, concept and topic. Um, if you look at those markers in, alert, in your alerted stem cell populations, what do you see in a sense? So CD34, PAC7, yeah. and then sort of going after the question over here, do you actually see MyoD coming, in, coming on in that alerted state? Okay, so I'm not sure which controversy you're referring to, but, but so there's certainly PAC7. Just in the literature between diff, you know, different labs have different markers that they'll use. Okay, so people use different markers for sorting the cells. Uh, they all seem to be to work. So I would say that you know, the canonical markers are, are PAC7. They're PAC7 positive. CD34, which quickly goes down with activation, they're CD34 positive, and they're MyoD negative. For sure, they're MyoD negative. So, so you, they haven't reached that stage of activation. They're, they're, they're TOR positive, MyoD negative. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I have a quick question. Yeah. Uh, the injuries that, that you've been uh, showing, they were all acute injuries, and I wonder if yep. you have any insight yet or any speculation on the effect of chronic injury on mobilizing these cells or putting them in alert state, and if that has any connection to maybe some kind of muscle wasting or, or um, dystrophic diseases. Okay, so good question. So, so we actually haven't done anything as a chronic injury model, but I mean, what relates to your question, so what we know is, we've done this now for a while, is that if we put cells in the alert state and we keep them there, it, it, it's a, it has a negative impact. That basically, over time, we deplete the, the muscle of stem cells. So this, is, this seems to be a positive acute response, but a negative chronic response. So if you're right, then that's exactly, let's say we were to produce a chronic inflammatory condition in the animal, and that alerted the cells. The prediction would be, from, from the data we have, is that that would ultimately lead to a depletion of the stem cell compartment. So, Thank yep, you. Yep. A question over here. Uh, I wonder, uh, if the immune system plays a role in transmitting the signal to put the cells into alert uh, condition? So it's, a, it's an important point. So again, we're, we're trying to figure out what the upstream pathways are that are controlling this. So um, again, we initially were kind of agnostic as to what it might be. Is it signals from immune cells that are migrating to the site of injury? Is it 
factors in the blood is it, um, so, so I, I can just tell you what we know. What, one of the things we know, people usually ask about some sort of neural connection. If we take blood from an injured animal and transfuse it into an uninjured animal, the cells alert. So it's in the blood, that, 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 that we know. Um, that's where we got the control experiment by doing the, the um, tail vein injection. Um, in terms of whether it's factors from the immune cells versus you know, just circulating proteins, we're still not sure. We have some evidence that, there's, that there may be a kind of enzymatic cascade involved, and, and I'll tell you why I think this. HGF is a, a, a protein that goes up with a lot of injuries, it goes up in the blood. But if we give HGF, we really don't see into the animal, we don't see this response, because HGF in muscle is maintained in an inactive form in the extracellular matrix, and is actually cleaved to an active form to, to bind to CMAT. So we, we are actually hypothesizing that whatever the signal is, the final common pathway anyway is an enzymatic cleavage of HGF. So we're, we're kind of working our way backwards from there, thinking what is it that might be leading to that enzymatic final step, and is it an enzymatic cascade? But that, that's our hypothesis. It could certainly be something released by, by uh, you know, f circulating immune cells. Yep. All right. Um, I suspect that the, uh, the slide that mentioned resveratrol stimulated some alcohol appreciation <laughs> circuitry. So they probably all want to People go. Thirsty. So, um, Thank you, Tom. That was Pleasure. Thank, so you. Could you, thank you. Thank you. And, and just just two things. Uh, one to thank uh, some 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 names. Uh, these are proxies because they were not assisted TDF by 11. other people. But no. uh, Jennifer Braswell, <laughs> we, we, we thank tried. you so much. <laughs> Please, a round of applause for doing all the stuff you do at CERN. And the two wonderful ladies from the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine, where's Bethany Cranach? She's not here, but at least Laura Parsons is up at the back there. So Bethany and Laura, thank you. <laughs> and in the booth, Kent Schnecker, keeping cameras rolling. Thank you. So uh, thank you all for being here. The dates next year, 2015, are exactly the same, October 7th to exactly the 9th. So see you here in exactly one year, I hope. Good night. <laughs>